Good afternoon, and welcome to today's Atlanta Council event, a conversation with the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Estonia, Margus Sakna. My name is Matthew Kranig, and I'm a Vice President at the Atlanta Council and Senior Director of the Council's Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security. Russia's unprovoked assault against Ukraine has upended European security and threatened the broader rules-based international system. Russia continues to blatantly threaten global norms, perhaps emboldening other revisionist actors to do the same. Just last week, the Iran-backed Hamas terrorist group perpetuated a vicious attack against Israel, disrupting movements toward normalization of relations and stability in the Middle East. And China continues to threaten Taiwan and poses the greatest state-based threat to the rules-based international system. Given these challenges, it's more important than ever that the United States and its like-minded allies and partners stand together to deter and defeat aggression and protect democratic values worldwide. In this regard, the Republic of Estonia has been a stalwart American ally, a shining example of an open market democracy in Eastern Europe, and a leading supporter of Ukraine and contributor to the defense of NATO's eastern flank. To discuss Estonia's role in navigating these global challenges, we're honored to have Estonia's Foreign Minister, Margus Sakna, here with us today for a conversation on how Estonia and its transatlantic allies can work together to reaffirm their collective support to Ukraine and safeguard democratic values. Convenings such as this are central to the Scowcroft Center's mission of developing sustainable, nonpartisan strategies to address the most important security challenges facing the United States and its allies. The Center honors General Brent Scowcroft's legacy of service and embodies his ethos of nonpartisan commitment to the cause of security, support for U.S. leadership and cooperation with allies and partners, and dedication to the mentorship of the next generation of leaders. The Scowcroft Center is happy to co-host this event with the Atlantic Council's Europe Center, uh, which seeks to promote transatlantic leadership and a strong Europe in turbulent times. In this spirit, Minister Sakna joins us to share Estonia's perspective of the evolving impacts of Russian aggression, his ideas for actions Estonia and its NATO allies can take to ensure aggression is not rewarded, uh, and malicious actors are held accountable. The Foreign Minister will be joined on stage by Rachel Rizzo. Uh, Rachel is a non-resident senior fellow in the Atlantic Council's Europe Center. She's an expert on European security and the transatlantic alliance. As a reminder, this meeting is public and on the record. We encourage our in-person and virtual participants to join the conversation. There will be time for questions after the panel discussion. And you can interact with us on X, formerly known as Twitter, by following at Atlantic Council and using our hashtag, hashtag Stronger with Allies. With that, I would now like to invite Minister Sakna to the podium for his opening remarks. Uh, Minister Sakna, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Dear friends, it's really a great honor and, and, and a great opportunity here to be together with you and everybody's uh, watching us from a distance. And I, as I understand, this is a result of the COVID crisis that uh, uh, not everybody is here, but the thousands and thousands of people are following us uh, from the distance. And uh, as a uh, citizen of Estonia, which is the e E, e and IT state and nation, so I really do enjoy that momentum. I come here to DC as well from Arkansas, and uh, I just wanted to feel and see uh, the situation and uh, what people are thinking outside on the DC bubble, we call it. And uh, it was really, really useful uh, trip there. And uh, it is uh, somehow like this that uh, we are living very close to the, the aggressor. Uh, and we, for us, it's clear why we are supporting uh, Ukraine and the Ukrainians are fighting for us. But we have to understand as well what is going on globally and the, the other side of the world. And it, the most important thing is to talk, talk to people and to ask what are the fears and what are the reasons of different opinions. But I'm very happy to have these opening uh, remarks here and then later we will have this uh, conversation and be, be open to ask any questions I'm trying to answer them. But yes, ladies and gentlemen, we are living in uh, unpredictable and dangerous times, in a world where constant challenges present themselves as the events throughout the week in Israel have shown. Let me be clear, we condemn in the strongest words the attacks by Hamas against Israel. Israel is fully right to defend itself and its people against such an atrocities in accordance with the international law. I grew up in Estonia under the Soviet occupation, 
which was as a, as a result of a swear of influence politics in the region. The collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991 enabled Estonia, among others, to rejoin the global community. These days, one can easily find Estonia in or near the top of most global rankings measuring the freedoms, transparency, lack of corruption, or economic development. I traveled to US primarily to talk about transatlantic security and steps that are necessary to push Russia out of Ukraine and strengthen the security of the entire Euro-Atlantic era. For Estonia, Russia's war in Ukraine poses an existential threat. Russia's war in Ukraine will be a defining moment for the future of transatlantic security. Peace at the cost of Ukraine's territorial integrity will provide a new opportunity for Russian aggression in a few years' time, if not earlier. Europe is doing its share in supporting Ukraine. Since the start of Russia's full-scale invasion, Estonia has concentrated on three major policies. The first, supporting Ukraine. Second, raising the cost of aggression. And third, fighting impunity. And these policies will remain our priorities. And I would like to speak about them later when we have uh, this discussion, what concerns the uh, raising the cost of aggression and accountability questions. But Putin hopes that he can outlive Western unity. And we must make sure it doesn't happen. The US leadership and bipartisan support to Ukraine has been unprecedented. My meetings in Washington have assured me that uh, this support will continue. The world needs a globally strong US foreign policy. While the war is still raging in Ukraine, we have to make sure this tragedy will not repeat itself in the future. Our first order of business is to help Ukraine to win the war. What follows is peace building and reconstruction. It is in our interest that uh, the belt of democracy stability and security in Europe expands. For a lasting peace, Estonia firmly believes that Ukraine should join both the European Union and NATO. Ukraine's future membership in these organizations is the clearest signal for our private sector that their long-term investments in Ukraine are safe. This turns Ukraine's reconstruction into a public-private partnership rather than leaving the bill to be paid only by our taxpayers. To conclude, some may ask, why would a small state take it upon itself to speak of such a great matters? Perhaps we should keep quiet, stay in our comfort zone. The thing is, our own history has taught us too well. The norms and rules we established today will determine our future. We want an international system that works for everyone and enables greater peace and prosperity. Otherwise, we will fall back into our era where might makes right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Foreign Minister, for those remarks. And once again, uh, welcome to the Atlantic Council. And thank you so much for being with us today. Um, we're going to have a, a bit of a discussion up here for a little bit. But for the last 15 or 20 minutes or so, I do want to turn to both the audience here in person and online. So uh, think about what questions you'd like to ask. There's a microphone right over here uh, in, in the right of the room. Um, so I'll be sure to turn to you and let you jump into the conversation as well. Um, first, I want to say, you know, you mentioned something at the end of your remarks. Why would a small state take it upon itself to speak on these matters in terms of Russian aggression and the rules-based international order. Um, I think Estonia and you and your prime minister and your defense minister deserve a huge um, thank you and uh, congratulations for the work that you've done in both supporting Ukraine and defending the transatlantic alliance. So I think everyone in this room can, can agree with that. And um, I think that's a good note to sort of start this conversation on. Um, this summer, I, I visited Latvia and Lithuania, and unfortunately have not made it to Estonia yet, but that will be next month, Welcome so, to Estonia, so. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you really get a sense of just 
first of all, th these are small states and Russia is close. It's, it's right there. So what's the mood like in, in Estonia amongst uh, the, the population in terms of maybe how their threat perception has changed after February of 2022 and how that support for Ukraine is continuing to hold uh, amongst the Estonian population? First of all, thank you for the good words, but uh, we will be happy then this aggression has been finished and, uh, and we will have been reestablishing as well the international law and, uh, and uh, recovered uh, Ukraine. But uh, uh, I would like to explain the, the mentality, how we live there. And uh, Estonians, we have been living the, the neighboring uh, and this area uh, geographically as well, like couple of thousands of years. And I can just say honestly, nothing good has come uh, during the last 300 years from East. So we know it. So, but we have decided to live there. And, and uh, of course, uh, I'm not very happy that uh, we were right during the last uh, two decades, and when we has uh, had, we, we have said uh, that uh, the aggression will come from the east side. Uh, 2008, when uh, Russia made an aggression against Georgia, and actually we, as a, as a Western community, we didn't do anything or not not enough. And 2014, when uh, Russia went into Ukraine, uh, we made some kind of uh, agreement to find a peace in Minsk, and we said that it will be repeated. Of course, we didn't know that it will be in a, such a scale as we have today. The Russian aggression, it's a, it's a full-scale war. It's a genocide. It's a deportation of more than 20,000 children. And, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, it's, it's everything against, against what we have agreed uh, about in the national law. But uh, we are not afraid because we know it, uh, that we are ready to fight. Then uh, what about the, uh, the real situation and now? is that actually the, the figures of the public support to support Ukrainians or to accept as well the refugees. We have uh, more than 60,000 refugees from Ukraine in Estonia, and our size is 1.3 million uh, people. In US, it's approximately, like if you, if you compare, about more than 20 million refugees to come into Ukraine. And uh, the support is still there, like more than 90%. So, and also on political level, this is a topic what we have agreed already in 1991 and two that uh, two major uh, principles that one is that we will never be alone again and the second is that uh, that we are we have consensus policy about the security and international affairs and this is still there even we are struggling heavily heavily uh, internally and on different domestic matters and as a proof of that uh, we decided to invest more to defense and next year the the, the investment level will be 3.3 percent of gdp and uh, we had to decide as well to increase taxes heavily. And the explanation mm. was that uh, we must invest to our independent capabilities of defense, but also we must support Ukraine constantly in the long term. And we have given uh, the military support to Ukraine more than 1% of GDP. And, and we are ready to do more. And the main reason is, uh, and the understanding is that actually Ukrainians are literally fighting uh, for us and instead of us. When I was defense minister 2016 and 17, we saw constantly 120,000 troops the other side of the border of Russia ready to go within 24 hours. The question is whether the Putin will give an order or not. Mm. The command line is very short, of course, but we were not afraid. But these troops are now literally gone. They are not existing anymore. They were sent to Ukraine and most of them, they are not existing, they're dead. So instead of us, Ukrainians are to, to uh, had get rid of that. So these are the, the, the small examples or, or the basic examples that we understand definitely that instead of having uh, the military conflict or aggression or the conflict between Russia and NATO, membership, me NATO members in our region, uh, Ukraine is fighting there. Mm -hmm. And it's most efficient and the cheapest way, if you say very brutally, to get rid of this uh, willingness of aggression from Russian side now. So, so obviously the, the Baltic states are uh, much more in focus since Russia's invasion of 2022, um, but they've always been a topic of discussion, especially as frontline states of, of NATO's eastern mm -hmm. flank. Um, more troops have been sent to the multinational battalions in each of these states, including Poland. Is enough being done to secure uh, NATO's eastern flank now, or what more could be done in your, in your 
I'm, I'm, I'm really satisfied with the developments, what we have done, and uh, the big change has been about uh, the thinking and, uh, and understanding that uh, when we decided to send this enhanced support at present uh, mission to Baltics and, and Poland, uh, it was much more based on, the, on, on uh, deterrence principles. Uh, and there I was a defense minister as well to, to negotiate the terms and command lines. And then I saw the hesitation as well that, uh, that you know, the, the clearance of, of understanding came that actually if something happens, these countries' uh, soldiers will be killed in the first uh, hours. So this is some, something that really, uh, you know, got in mind of the different countries' uh, governments. But uh, there was a readiness to do it. It was 2016-17. But now I think everybody understands that actually uh, all these plans what we have, uh, we must be ready to use them mm -hmm. in a full scale because we see the full scale aggression from, from Russia. And uh, this is a big change. And of course, uh, the practical steps what we have made all together in NATO and together with our allies is that we have more troops on the ground. We have uh, more independent capabilities uh, on military level and also uh, in this uh, Vilnius summit what we had uh, this summer we adopted the, the very solid and very concrete uh, defense plans for our region but uh, the historical step as well what was made uh, was that uh, Finland and Sweden decided to join the NATO and uh, Finland is already fully in mm -hmm. and I'm sure that uh, Sweden will get uh, the final decision so. from our two to allies uh, mm -hmm. uh, soon. Uh, but what we mu must understand as well that uh, the Finland is of course a uh, very strong military power as Sweden as well and, and the bordering country. But remarkable is that the, the Swedish people decided voluntarily to join NATO. Uh, even they had uh, close to 300 years of neutrality policy before. So, the feeling of the threat and aggression from Russia is there. It's not only the question that Ukrainians are want to join the NATO or we support them because we are somehow, somehow like bordering nations, but the Swedish people felt it in a very clear way. And uh, this is something we have to understand that if people are feeling like this as a society of Sweden, so things are very serious and uh, it gives us as well the understanding that uh, our region is more safe and also be honest, the Baltic Sea is now the, the NATO lake, and then for practical defense capabilities, it gives us a, as a huge support because the, the sea size was always uh, the cap somehow to our region. Uh, going to uh, ask about the NATO lake, um, I, we've heard that framing a lot, uh, especially since Finland joined and Sweden will join. Is that a helpful framing? Is there is there a worry that if you refer to this region now as a NATO lake, that it might seem as though the security situation in that region is taken care of, um, or does it bring more focus to to the Baltic Sea region? What are your thoughts? What are your thoughts on that? <clears throat> it brings more focus, and uh, unfortunately, I have to uh, uh, touch the topic as well. What we um, what we had like a week ago uh, in in the, this or under the NATO lake. So uh, we had a, a destruction uh, of the, the strategic gas pipeline between Estonia and Finland and also the communication cables uh, between Estonia and Finland. And uh, yesterday we announced as well there is some kind of uh, disturbance uh, between uh, the cable uh, uh, between Estonia and Sweden. So this is serious matter. Mm -hmm. We are investigating very closely, but it is obvious, I've seen these pictures and these videos about the gas pipeline, that uh, this damage has, this is man-made, the mechanical damage. We know, of course, as well, that uh, what kind of ships uh, were close and, and uh, were maneuvering at this time, but uh, as a members of NATO, as a surrounding countries of the NATO lake, we must be very sure about if you say that uh, who did what exactly. Mm -hmm. And the second uh, exper how to say experience is to act together with Finland, because for Finland uh, it is one of the first uh, so-called uh, real situations when we act together as a, uh, as a me NATO members. And I'm, I'm, but I'm very satisfied as well with reaction and readiness from the NATO side and also European Union and from all our allies. 
uh, to react on the proper way if there is a need. Mm -hmm. So this is something uh, what we actually uh, witness already now. This is not a theory. You mentioned a, f a few notes in your opening remarks um, about priorities. One, of course, is supporting Ukraine, um, which we've, we've talked about and I think you highlighted really well. But you also mentioned a couple other things, raising the cost of aggression um, and accountability. I want to first ask you about raising the cost of aggression. Can you expand on that a little bit? And have we sufficiently raised the cost of aggression based on the Western response to Russia's invasion? Thank you for this question, because uh, we have to deal with all the different uh, matters at the same time uh, in the meaning of supporting Ukraine to win the war, support militarily, uh, we, we must support it financially and politically. But also we have to uh, deal with, uh, with, uh, with Russian war machine and also uh, raise the cost uh, for the future because I cannot see the change of the mentality in, in uh, visible uh, future. Uh, sanctions are more, very important and also we are already uh, preparing the, the 12th package of sanctions in European Union and of course the US sanctions. But uh, we, have, uh, we have, uh, lots of Russian assets uh, in our con under our control, and uh, last week I passed the Estonian government, and now the Estonian Parliament is going to discuss about the law draft. How can we use Russian frozen assets even during the war, private and and and, and the public assets? Because uh, it is harder and harder to explain to our taxpayers that why we're using uh, our taxpayers' money to uh, build up the Ukraine or to support it when the aggression is not paying anything. So. We must use Russian money, uh, Russian oligarchs' money, to uh, support Ukraine. And uh, I see that there is a political will, and I had uh, many meetings as well uh, in uh, DC uh, yesterday, today, uh, about this topic. And of course, US has the, here uh, like the leadership position, but uh, the main so-called excuse in Europe has been that uh, we are lacking of a legal basis or a legal frame for that. So we have developed the, uh, the scheme or the process or the legal frame based on the international law and based on the constitution which Estonia has. And Estonia has uh, one of the most conservative uh, constitution in Europe about uh, the private property protection. Mm. So, and uh, just to explain very, very, very shortly is that actually we rely on the United Nations declaration about uh, that uh, Russia is an aggression country and, uh, and uh, implementing aggression there. Then we have this uh, register of damages uh, in The Hague, uh, which is international organization recognized. All the damages what has made uh, from Russia during the war now, they have been documented. What scale, where, when, uh, it is all there. And then the international sanctions against Russia and also against the, uh, the different companies and persons. These are all documented in European Commission and also US and whoever has put these sanctions. And then we have this uh, so-called domestic law. So if Ukraine has the claim against uh, Russia, of course Russia won't accept it. So the claim is coming to Estonia. Our court system is actually dealing with that and giving the uh, assets free and give the money. And instead of this ownership, we don't take it away from the owner of the assets, mm -hmm. but just give them the right of claim against Russian government of aggression. So, and we are not actually harming the constitutional right. And this is universal scheme. Uh, it can be used uh, on all different places. And we, uh, my, my, our main idea is that we don't have like a huge portion of, uh, of different uh, assets in Estonia, Russian, about approximately like 40 million euros. Mm -hmm. But uh, the reason is to create the case based on the, on the rule of law in Estonia, in European Union, which is really, really strong. And, and uh, to be as an example and open the, the way for that. Uh, and the next level is already the political decision whether to do it or not. I really do hope that we will do it. Do you think there's support throughout the European Union for this approach? Uh, it's finally uh, 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 the question of European Union, of course, but also the different uh, member states, uh, mm -hmm. because we show as well that we can act like uh, like nationally in the meaning that uh, because the sanctions has put mainly and uh, the, the the assets they have been uh, pro prison uh, by the national governments. So it is as well the, the free <laughs> free way of thinking. So. 
you also mentioned um, accountability, holding leaders accountable yeah. for, for crimes of aggression. Can you expand on that a little bit? Not just Vladimir Putin, but other leaders as well. Yes, exactly. That everybody knows that uh, International Criminal Court uh, uh, put the warrant uh, against Putin. That he's, he's, uh, but this is, uh, this is uh, about the crimes against the children. But this is not the crimes about the aggression crimes. And ICC has no jurisdiction to deal with the leadership crimes of aggression. And this is uh, the, the big problem in the meaning of, uh, of uh, to, to reestablish the justice uh, in the meaning. This is a clear case uh, that Russia has committed the aggression. This is a leadership uh, decision and all the proofs are there. And if we are not dealing with that now, then uh, we will have a problems to explain not only to Ukrainians but to our people as well that how can it be that uh, the aggressor and the person as a leader of, uh, of the nation uh, has not put under the trial. Mm -hmm. the, the case is that uh, they are now enjoying the immunity and our position is clear that no one should enjoy the immunity uh, about the aggression crimes uh, and the aggression crimes are the leadership crimes. So, and, and uh, one important thing is that uh, one uh, war, what we finished in a so-called proper way, and the last war, it was the Second World War. Mm -hmm. And we dealt all these matters. And the Nuremberg uh, process, what we, what, we, what we know everybody. And after the Second World War, we created the new institution on the international law. This is a leadership crimes of aggression. So, and now we need to deal with that as well. We cannot just forget it, just uh, let's not deal it now, because then I don't know how we explain to our children and, uh, and our future. So we must form the special tribunal to deal with that. And that is a legal way to do it uh, under the United Nations uh, 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 mandate mm -hmm. to uh, Secretary General to make an agreement with Ukraine and, and then to ask together the special tribunal to investigate that, to put uh, the leadership and Troika on the trial. So that is the way, but now we need the political support for that. And this is the question we have to face. And this is not the question only that Estonia is, uh, is somehow dealing, but uh, our independence and sovereignty and, uh, and our, our state as a nation, we are relay on the international law. And we have been under the occupation and we have lost like one uh, fourth of our population. Our Children were deported as well as uh, Ukrainian children now. And uh, these are the aggression crimes. Of course, crimes against humanity and, uh, and war crimes. And ICC is doing the great job. But uh, aggression crimes are the leadership crimes. And we have to face it. You mentioned the UN. Um, I mean, it's interesting where you have Russia and China on the Security Council. You had many countries in the global south. Mm -hmm not vote to condemn Russia's invasion, but you see the UN as a potential framework for, for this sort of accountability. Yes, of course. Uh, the United Nations General Assembly week in uh, New York was just a couple of weeks ago, and, uh, and uh, I participated there as well. What I see and what I saw uh, was that uh, they're like the globally the great uh, uh, concern about uh, the UN Charter, how does it work, but actually it doesn't work in the meaning of the Security Council when the aggression is a permanent member and uh, using the veto right. But, and this is not only the question of uh, Russian aggression against uh, Ukraine and all the crimes there, uh, this is uh, the wider question that how can we guarantee that the peace and security will be remained and the United Nations is a unique organization for that. But we have to uh, explain and we have to find the different uh, explanations uh, for all the different nations globally that why we are dealing with that. And we have to get uh, rid of this uh, fear uh, about the gray shadows from the different pasts because uh, this is unique situation and this is clear case in the meaning what Russia is doing against uh, Ukraine. And uh, just a one example uh, that we organized uh, together with US, Ukraine and Belgian government the high-level uh, side event about the uh, deportation of Ukraine children. We know that there is more than 20,000 Ukraine children deported now to Russia, Belarus. Russia. We don't know what is going on with them. But this is, these are the topics which are touching uh, people globally. Mm -hmm. 
governments globally, mothers and fathers globally, because if somebody is thinking that uh, this is some kind of military conflict in Europe, but it's not our business, then these are the stories which are waking up uh, people everywhere, and we have to constantly uh, talk about them, and these are the opportunities to open the mind for the more complicated questions as uh, leadership crimes as well. Before we, I want to talk about a couple other issues, especially China, but before we turn that page, um, you mentioned the importance of, of telling stories and messaging. And I'd be interested to hear more about your trip to Arkansas right before this. Um, obviously, we are here in Washington. We all, you know, watching this event in, in this audience at the Atlantic Council and the government care a lot about uh, multilateral institutions, about supporting Ukraine, about holding leaders to account. Did you find that that messaging was getting through to the people that you spoke to outside of Washington in the United States heartland? Absolutely. I think that people are the same. I believe that we are good people, or people are naturally good. But uh, we have to understand as well about uh, the concerns and, and, and the worries and the problems what we have uh, uh, all over the world. And uh, it is understandable that everybody understands that if, uh, if there is a aggression and, and uh, an unlawful killing of people and rapings and uh, deportation and so on, this is, this is everybody understands. But the question is that uh, why uh, taxpayers must pay for that? What are the results? And the question is that uh, what is the price? And uh, it very easily said that actually we, if we are not uh, take uh, care of the situation now, it will be more costful in the future as well. I think that uh, this is a unique situation when the brave nation as Ukrainians are, they are fighting for us. Uh, they are ready to fight. They don't ask us to send our boys or girls to the war, as that is that mean has been before in the, some other conflicts. But what they need is that just our support, the military support, and get rid of this aggression and uh, push Russia back to Russia, and not uh, not uh, not to, not to repeat this kind of aggressions. Because uh, in the future, if we are not dealing with that now, uh, somehow uh, the Ukrainians are in front of that. Mm -hmm. So it will come back to us anyways. It's a one thing. The second is actually it is really, really heavily uh, harming our values and our way of living, our freedom. And I think the people in U.S. definitely understand what is the freedom, what does it mean. Mm -hmm. and, but also more practical ways. Uh, actually, the defense industry is booming now as well. So uh, I was visiting the Lockheed Martin factory uh, in Arkansas. Uh, we have the most, uh, the biggest uh, defense uh, agreement uh, since today, uh, 300 million dollars worth uh, HIMARS uh, rocket systems. Uh, it, it creates jobs as well in this area, I think. And this is maybe cynical, but this is a reality where we are living in. But also the reconstruction works uh, to Ukraine. Everybody remembers the Marshall Plan mm -hmm. after the Second World War. And uh, it really uh, pushed, I think, U.S. economy as well as European economy uh, on a new level uh, after the, uh, the war. And, but uh, Ukraine is a, like the Texas-size country and has a huge potential for the future. And together with Ukrainians, we can rebuild it. And also we can ask, and of course, the main, main how to say, responsibilities going not to our taxpayers, but to our, public, uh, our private companies. And this is the reason as well, I'm putting one more argument on the table, why we must give the very clear uh, uh, security guarantees to Ukraine yeah. as a membership of NATO, because NATO membership is the only working security guarantee in our region at least, is that actually to, to give uh, the guarantees to our private sector to make a long-term investments to Ukraine and to rebuild Ukraine together with Ukrainians. And uh, be honest, gain something back to our economies. So these like different uh, arguments, if you put it on the table and you just have a momentum to discuss about them, taking like emotion down, then people are very rational finally and they understand 
but the same values what we have. This is this is everywhere the same. No one, I have not not, not met any people who says that they don't care about what is going on there. Mm -hmm. The question is much more domestic, and I understand it really well. Yeah. I had to explain to Estonian people why we are increasing taxes so heavily, and they are ready to to do it if they understand why, and this is for their own security and future. So NATO membership for Ukraine is 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 the be-all, end-all. That's the ultimate security guarantee. Because coming out of Vilnius, there were, there was a G7 statement, there have been you know, bilateral arrangements. Yeah. It's Article 5. I'm very happy that G7 uh, uh, had this uh, declaration of support Ukraine, and Estonia has uh, joined this declaration as well. But these are much more the assurances uh, for, uh, for the next uh, long-term uh, commitments. Uh, uh, to give the, the military support, the financial support, uh, and political support, but these are not the security guarantees yeah. in the meaning of uh, guarantee the security if Russia will have a new aggression. So uh, the only security guarantee which is working is a NATO membership. But we have to take it as well, not, uh, not uh, just we want to help Ukraine. No, the other way around. Can you imagine uh, the situation that after the war, when Ukraine is a member of NATO, uh, actually Ukraine is one of the, the, the most biggest and powerful military force in Europe at this time, probably. And uh, they can as well uh, deliver the security to our region. If we talk about the Kowalki cap or, or mm -hmm. whatever we're talking about. So this is an opportunity for us as well. And uh, as well, there is another question, uh, security guarantees, is the, the membership of European Union. Yeah. Uh, we are standing very strongly that the European Union uh, must decide uh, at the end of this year to start official negotiation process uh, uh, with Ukraine. This is historical momentum as well. Of course, to get uh, and to become the full member of uh, European Union, it takes time. There are many, many questions. I think it's, it's, it's even harder to get uh, the membership of EU than the membership of NATO. Yeah, For that, like we it. just need uh, <laughs> to have a consensus uh, around the table. But uh, what I wanted to say is well, uh, as well that uh, this momentum is a historical opportunity for all of us. I've said it publicly as well, and uh, I'm not diplomat in the good ways maybe, but uh, maybe during the last 30 years, uh, we have witnessed that different uh, so-called uh, democratic revolutions in Ukraine as well. But we weren't like sure finally uh, in what direction this leadership is finally taking, whether towards Moscow or neutral or towards us. But now it is clear that for the next generations, Ukraine never go back to under the Russia. Yeah. They belong to us. And now it is our uh, responsibility to give them this opportunity to join us, to, s to share the same values but as well that uh, it is in our interest as well. And of course, uh, I was mentioning this kind of neutrality policy or the gray zones policy. It is bankrupt. Mm -hmm. So what I see as well as a, as a, as a future, uh, uh, the security architecture in our region and Europe as a whole, is that uh, the no gray zone policy must continue and uh, also the membership of NATO is, is, uh, is a very strong part of that. So before I turn to the audience, I have a few questions here that I want to get to. But a reminder, there is also a microphone. So if anyone in the audience would like to stand up and ask a question, please make your way over there. Um, but just shifting the conversation just a little bit to China, because I don't think we can have this conversation without talking about China. Um, they are increasing investments in critical infrastructure. Uh, there are Belt and Road projects. In, in and around Europe um, can, and I guess is Europe striking a correct balance between um, competing and cooperating with China? Does Europe sort of feel like it's stuck in the middle of a US-China great power competition? Europe is in the middle of the big changes, uh, really, be mainly because of the aggression of Russia. And uh, I'm saying very openly that like 20 months ago, Mainly we discussed in European Union about uh, the, uh, the green transformation, but also the, uh, how much money we'll give or more money we'll give to our farmers. Mm. Now, uh, what the European Union is doing, we investing heavily to our defense capabilities and also we support uh, very strongly uh, Ukraine as a third country military waste. This change has been very big. 
but also the understanding that, uh, that China is not just uh, like economical partner. And China uses this economical power and uh, the influence uh, in political ways. Uh, as well, uh, how much China is using now the Russian position uh, as an aggression. It is cool that, uh, that China is not supporting military ways and publicly, but we know as well their position, that they have still a cooperation there. And of course, uh, China has, I call it like a thousand year plan for the future. So, and, and definitely this situation is, is uh, they take out as much as they can to increase their influence in the world. And we have to face it, how much actually we are dependent on that economical connection, uh, because this is political as well. And in the EU, EU, we have these discussions, but it is really hard to, to do something like a scratch, like overnight. So uh, we have uh, formed this uh, strategy to understand that what kind of partnership we, we have and we will have. And, uh, and it means as well, uh, you know, about the rare metal question. Mm, uh, yeah. uh, this is a big investment program uh, in EU to get rid of this uh, dependence uh, from Russia and, and many, many other questions. And also it's crucial to, to have a very strong transatlantic relations, not only on the security level, but I mean as well the economical level, to understand that actually we are the big uh, economical uh, potential here all together. So I, I don't believe that nothing uh, or anything will happen overnight, but it is good change that we have uh, this uh, understanding in our minds, and we are discussing about that, uh, that uh, what we can do more, not to be influenced, used by the economical relations, uh, uh, by Russia, uh, mm -hmm. political wills. So it's there, and in the U.S. very strongly. It is, certainly. Um, there's a couple questions here that I want to get to. Just really quickly, for those people watching online, uh, you can submit questions at askac.org. So I, I don't think I made that clear at the beginning, askac.org. Um, I will go to our audience members. Uh, just quick, make it relatively quick and make sure it's a question. That'd be great. Thank you so much. Uh, thank <laughs> you very much. And thank you very much, Minister, for uh, what you've mentioned and what you said about Georgia. I am Georgian. I'm the member of the parliament of Georgia, but I resigned in protest to my government's policies. Uh, and that should say it all about the Georgia situation today. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for what you said, because it was very important in 2008 that Estonia stood by Georgia, and your participation and your help in Georgia's, uh, uh, in raising Georgia's question in 2008, especially the Estonian kitchen that has done an amazing job, was something very particular. What we are seeing today, and I'm not talking about the, 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 the war and the aggression Russia continued after Georgia, because Georgia was the testing ground, and Russia tested every Everything in Georgia that it implemented farther on in Ukraine, and unfortunately, nobody listened to us, uh, and nobody listened to our friends in 2008, and whatever happened, happened after 2008. Um, what we are observing today is that it's not only the physical war that Russia is carrying out, but it is also the hybrid war. It's also the cyber attacks. It's also the propaganda. And uh, we are unfortunately in the in the Western democracies. We are uh, losing the propaganda war to Russia from what we are seeing and what we're observing today. Estonia has the greatest experience, and as you mentioned, from the IT perspective, you are one of the best countries in the region, if not in the world. So. What I, it is rather a suggestion than a question that Estonia should be running the anti-propaganda war against the hybrid war that Russia is carrying out because you have the experience, you have the experience from the attacks that Russia carried out before the war in Georgia in Estonia, and you have the experience living next door to Russia and you know their tactics, and I think it will be a huge help to the Western society that Estonia leads this, uh, let's say, coalition to help counter the Russian propaganda globally. Thank, thank you, you so much for your, thank you. Can I address that? Yeah, thank you for these comments and, uh, and really we are, as Estonians, we are the, the best friends for Georgians. And you mentioned this Estonian kitchen. Uh, I was participating there as well many times and, uh, and support Georgia to do different reforms. But uh, yes, we are in a, such a situation right now. But my message is uh, very clear uh, about the Georgia as well, that uh, we are constantly support uh, the Georgians' people will uh, to join uh, our families in the meaning of, uh, of uh, European Union, NATO, uh, 
I think that uh, we can argue about the leadership questions and the government policies, policies but uh, this is, these are the long-term uh, commitments what we have uh, with the Georgians and Georgian people. And, uh, and uh, I, I believe in that, that we, if we can get rid of uh, the Russian aggression and, uh, and support Ukraine to win the war, uh, there will be the, 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 the big changes in this era as well to make the, the, the decisions whether to be connected to Russia or actually to, to break free. That's the, that's the case, what I wanted to say. Yes, Estonia has experience, uh, experiences about the cyber and hybrid attacks, and that we are constantly under the cyber attacks, uh, like hundreds maybe per, 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 per day. But this is uh, like the, the normal living standard what we have. And we have been working heavily with the private sector and the pro uh, public sector to be ready for that. And we are, of course, uh, ready to share this, uh, uh, these experiences. But of course, we have to work together. And uh, somehow we are happy that uh, we are having the uh, NATO Center of Excellence about uh, cyber uh, uh, security in Estonia. So uh, this is some, something what we do together. And actually, Ukraine joined uh, this Center of Excellence uh, this year. And, uh, and from Ukraine as well, from Moldova, who is a very important partner for us, we get like everyday new experiences about different hybrid threats and, uh, and actions. And about this information, uh, we, we can lead everything in the world, but uh, the question is we must do all this together and, uh, and uh, we have some limited resources. Uh, we are the neighboring country of Russia, and, uh, and but at the same time we are we are the, the top uh, country in the world about uh, uh, the, the freedom of media and and, uh, and the free world. So this is this is very important for us. But we have closed down actually more than 50 different web pages uh, of disinformation and also TV channels and so on. And we want to have uh, this kind of support uh, to the private media as well. That, uh, that people can, uh, if they want to get even the Russian language uh, news or information, they can get the solid information. But this is something what we have to do together. <coughs> so we can see as well uh, the very, very uh, boring situation now in Israel and, and, uh, and the Hamas uh, terror attacks. One part is a physical, what is going on there. But the other part is actually fight for the minds mm. and using any kind of information pieces. And, uh, but we are living in a situation when uh, the conflicts are selling well and, uh, and all the communication is personal. And can you remember actually when Ukraine, I think, uh, has won the war against Russia? For me, actually, it was the, the momentum when Bucha came public to everybody. I think it was actually a change of the mentality. I have met many leaders of, uh, of different countries, and I know that they're mostly very good people. But the change of leadership actually became after that, because people understood finally what really is going on in Ukraine. So that's why the uh, fight against the disinformation is important, but more important is even actually to deliver the, the objective information and, and to deliver actually all these kind of terrible things, what really happening all in, in this, uh, this, uh, these conflicts. And I think that people, they know uh, what kind of decisions uh, they have to make and the leadership, leaderships, uh, because we are democratic countries and we have elections uh, uh, coming mm. everywhere, they are following uh, because they need more voters. One more question from the audience, then we'll turn online. Uh, Maybe Mr. introduce Mi yourself. Yeah, Mr. Too. Minister, it's great to see you here in Washington. My name is Benjamin Schmidt. I'm a uh, senior fellow at the Penn Climate Center for Energy Policy at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, I'm former European Energy Security Advisor, where I covered, among other locations, uh, Estonia. And so I know well the importance that Estonia has placed on energy security for many, many years. Um, Estonia, of course, has been uh, a leader not only on security of supply and market issues, but also on physical and cybersecurity of energy infrastructure and understanding the threat that projects like Nord Stream 2 and uh, energy security projects of the Russian Federation have um, in the hybrid space, in the military space. So with that in mind, I started my project uh, that I'm currently working on, on critical infrastructure protection across the continent, going to Estonia and in particular uh, this last summer, the first stop of my entire trip, uh, of the first trip of this project was to Poldiski, to 
the Baltic connector mm -hmm. site into the uh, the jetty that's currently at Poldiski for uh, LNG uh, import eventually. Uh, so two part, very brief questions. Number one, given the situation with the Baltic connector uh, and the, the lack of uh, optionality now that has been taken away between trading gas between Finland and Estonia, will Estonia prioritize bringing a floating storage and regasification unit to Poldiski this winter? Uh, and the second question, with all of the uh, open source analysis that's been going on, including some of the, some that I'm working on, it's it's pretty clear that there were um, Russian vessels in the vicinity of the Swedish to uh, to Estonia uh, telecommunications cable damage site, the Baltic connector damage site, and the FEC Finland Estonia telecommunications damage site, as well as other actors. Um, some of these vessels were also seen. Uh, before uh, the Nord Stream blasts ahead of the, uh, the, the Nord Stream blasts at the Nord Stream blast sites. What can you say about that? And this may be an unanswerable question at this point, but if it is shown to be a state actor that is behind this and perpetrated this act that has been called man-made, what does Estonia and what does NATO do from here? Super easy questions. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we have a manual for that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but we have to decide and we have to prove, actually, the, the starting point, uh, yeah. of course. But first question, thank you. This is a very important question. And we have really invested in our region uh, a lot to the, the energy security. But uh, the situation is right now like this, that this uh, party connector, which is uh, meant to deliver gas between uh, our two countries, but also with uh, the Latvia, Lithuania, it is out of order. And uh, it, it is probably out of order since this spring, April, May, depends uh, well, how rapid uh, reconstruction works can be. But uh, there is no concern that, uh, that we cannot uh, li <laughs> live over the winters. Now Estonia is getting the gas from the Latvia, and uh, there are enough resources to live easily the, the, the winter. And also in Paldiski, you mentioned as well, uh, there is now ready uh, the capabilities to, to have the LNG, uh, and we are happy about that. Uh, about this, uh, this LNG and, and uh, some of the suppliers, uh, the private sector must take as well the partnership, and also it's like it is under the, the, our government control. Um, now about Finland, uh, uh, they have uh, enough resources as well uh, to survive, but they, are, they have more complicated situation because now they are out of the, this uh, Baltic uh, connector pipeline. But they have as well the LNG capabilities. Now the final question is uh, maybe even more for the, for the people who are living in Finland and in Estonia as well, is the, the question, uh, the price of the gas, what, we, what, what, what will be? But uh, this is like the practical things, and uh, it doesn't harm our, our people's lives and our, our economy now. Uh, now the second question is that uh, we must be clear, and uh, we must be, have the facts and put different thoughts together who actually did and who did what. Because uh, if there is finally the proven action and with the willingness of uh, of attack uh, the undersea infrastructure of two uh, NATO member states. So there is, as I said as well, manual about that, what to do. But before that, we must be clear. And these cases are always very difficult to, to find finally. If you have any kind of uh, uh, materials or the analysis, we are more than happy to, to receive them. Uh, but the investigation is going on together with uh, Finland and also together with uh, Sweden. Uh, to get uh, to get a clear picture and to put different thoughts together, but what we have done already is, of course, to communicate and and uh, discussions uh, uh, with NATO and also EU partners. Uh, so, uh, what I think that we'll see in the near future is uh, more visible participation from the NATO side as well as a deterrence uh, movements. Uh, but I'm I'm absolutely sure that if there is a need to act then NATO can act. We have these capabilities ready, we have plans ready, but uh, we don't have to f you know, use this momentum just to increase some kind of, uh, you know, the panic or whatever. Let's be sure. But uh, I'm, I'm very solid positioned that uh, we can act if there is a need for that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Question online. So it's sort of a tough question, but you mentioned it. Uh, you mentioned Israel in your 
opening remarks. Mm -hmm. And the question is, what does the war in Israel mean for the war in Ukraine? Um, which is a good question and I think worth answering. Um, I think what would also be interesting is just to talk a little bit about, um, you, do you see this? I mean, how are you thinking about what's happening in, in the Middle East right now? Um, how is your government sort of looking at this, this situation? And are you worried about this uh, yeah. spreading or affecting the war in Ukraine? Um, of course, everybody knows that all this uh, so-called problem or the conflict, uh, it has been lasted already like decades. Yeah. And now the question is that uh, how much does it escalate? Uh, for Estonia and the Estonian government, it's clear, and we have contempt in, uh, in very strong words uh, these terroristic attacks uh, from Hamas against Israel people. Uh, and uh, Israel has all the rights to defend uh, itself and, uh, and its people, of course. But now is the question that uh, what kind of escalation will come? and uh, how much actually the region is going more and more in, 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 in the crisis and the meaning of, of this conflict. The second part is as well that we see already today that uh, this kind of uh, conflict situation has spread all over the world, all the different countries which are not part of this conflict like, uh, like regionally. And of course uh, we, are not, we, are, we are concerned uh, uh, that uh, the attention what we had uh, on uh, on uh, Russian aggression against Ukraine, now it has uh, you know moved to the Israel situation. So, and I'm not talking about the tension as a media. I'm, I'm talking about the tension uh, to support uh, Ukraine and everything what we have been uh, speaking here and discussed here before. But I think that we are able to walk and chew the gum at the same time as a democratic world. So we have to deal with uh, all the different uh, conflicts and, uh, and as well to find uh, the way and to find an allies uh, to, uh, to keep uh, this situation and not to escalate uh, in, a, in a huge scale. Um, I had a meeting with the Saudi Arabian uh, economic minister in Estonia. It was planned visit to Estonia. Mm. Uh, just a couple of day after, uh, days after the, uh, the terroristic attacks. And I, I asked uh, them as well that please use your influence uh, in the region uh, not to keep it this escalation under control. But of course, uh, what we saw, uh, the, the bombing or, or the, this tragedy, what happened mm -hmm. in the hospital, hundreds of people are dead. Um, now the question who did what, but this is as well, you know, as I said before, this is a tragic conflict, uh, awful videos about what is going on and people are touched from that. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, this escalation is not only the question what is really happening in this region, in the Gaza sector and so on, but the escalation is the question as well in our people's minds, actually, what is going to happen? Mm -hmm. So, and of course we are concerned uh, what will be, but let's see. Uh, everybody, and the President Biden and then Secretary Blinken, and really I think that they're trying as well to, to, to somehow to help the, to keep this uh, conflict uh, under control, if we can say uh, this kind of word at all. Yeah, yeah, it's difficult. Yeah. Um, Mr. Foreign Minister, thank you so much for, for your time and for visiting us here at the Atlantic Council. It's always an, an honor to, to host you and, and, and to have you here. Um, I want to also thank the uh, Embassy of the Republic of Estonia for their support, uh, members here in our in-person audience and online for taking part in this discussion. And again, just reiterating what was said at the beginning, um, a big thank you to you and Estonia for standing for democratic values and for the Transatlantic Alliance and the importance um, of partners and allies in a time of geopolitical uncertainty and change. Um, you're a leader in, in this space, and uh, I, we always know that we can, we can count on you and uh, Estonia's leadership and people. So thank you so much for being with us today again. Thank you very much for this opportunity, and uh, I think that the work that Atlantic Council is doing is, is most important, and uh, we, are, we are together with you. Thank you again. Thank you.